Uh, this is our first week. Uh, administrative law is a subject that is often maligned as boring, incoherent, or both. It is anything but boring. If it is incoherent, it is only because it encompasses so much of what is important to us, both collectively and as a plurality of individuals. Because it is poorly understood, administrative law is easy to caricature as standing for something dark and sinister. The deep state, of which we hear so often now, operates according to administrative law. The law of the deep state would probably attract a greater enrollment, but let's stick with administrative law. By the end of the semester, we should have a better appreciation of what the term the deep state might mean. We should also be in a position to decide whether a shallow state would be preferable to our deep state. It may turn out that the depth of the deep state reflects the depth of the challenges we together face in governing ourselves as a free people. The United States is a nation formed of 13 former colonies of Great Britain on the North American continent. Although North America was already populated by numerous Native American nations, they were not included in the Union. The framers of the U.S. Constitution saw themselves as creating an original charter of government for an as yet virtually uninhabited territory. We the people is the phrase that begins the preamble to the United States Constitution. We are invited to think of ourselves as the authors of our own government. The Constitution, speaking the name of we the people, charters a federal government to form a more perfect union to pursue certain ends, the national defense and domestic tr tranquility, to establish justice, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and for generations to come. No one of these three ends, justice, pr prosperity, and liberty, is assigned a priority in the text of the Constitution. There are different perspectives we can take in considering the subject. One is normative, a fancy word for moral. We can ask whether our government is just or legitimate, in whole or in any of its many parts. We can ask what reforms would improve things or which of several possible interpretations of the law present it in the best light. Another perspective is descriptive. We can ask about how the government actually operates, taking it as it is rather than how it ought to be. But our perspective is a legal one. We are inquiring about the content of the law. This inquiry, of course, presupposes an understanding of institutions and practices as we find them. And it often involves asking what is the best understanding of the meaning of legal materials, including the Constitution, statutes, and agency regulations. Our subject involves certain kinds of actors. Some are private, people like you and me, but also artificial persons such as corporations, churches, universities, and non-governmental organizations of all sorts. These actors do not make administrative law, but are affected by it in various ways that we will study. The actors that make administrative law are agencies, public actors. These public actors or agencies are found on different levels. There is a federal level, that is, within proper bounds, supreme. There is a state level. Each of the 50 states has its own administrative law. There are public actors at the sub-state level. Counties, municipalities, special purpose districts, each may have its own law administration, that is, its own administrative law. Our focus is on federal law, almost exclusively. We simply do not have time to cover state administrative law, which of course varies from state to state. Certain federal constitutional doctrines define limits to state administrative law, and we will take a look at that. But our focus throughout will be federal. The body of federal administrative law has developed and evolved over the nation's history. Although some aspects of American history can be grasped without any reference to administrative law, there are others that cannot be understood in any other way. There is a sense, then, in which understanding administrative law is part of our understanding of ourselves, of our self-understanding. The U.S. Constitution defines a government of three branches. Article I sets out the nature and powers of Congress. Article II defines the office of the president, the chief executive and commander of chief of the armed forces, and its powers. Article III of the Constitution defines the judicial branch, the Supreme Court and whatever lower federal courts Congress might create. Looking at the executive branch, 
The only office explicitly created is that of the presidency itself and the vice presidency. During George Washington's first term, Congress created the Office of Secretary of the Treasury to receive revenue, pay bills, and otherwise manage the young nation's finances. Congress during that same term created the Office of Secretary of War, now known as Secretary of Defense. During that term, Congress also created the Office of Secretary of State to manage foreign affairs. Congress also created the Office of Attorney General to handle legal affairs and prosecute crimes against the United States. Finally, during that busy first term, Congress created a post office so that the people could more easily and reliably communicate. In 1849, the Department of the Interior was created to manage the vast lands belonging to we the people. In 1862, early in the Civil War, Congress created the Department of Agriculture. In 1865, near the end of the Civil War, Congress created the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, known as the Freedmen's Bureau. Housed in the War Department, the Freedmen's Bureau relieved hunger, built hospitals, legalized marriages and resettlement of refugees, and integrated the freed slaves into the labor force. It helped build schools and colleges. The Bureau was fiercely opposed by President Andrew Johnson, and agents of the Bureau were subject to terrorism in the South as a focus of racial animosity. The Freedmen's Bureau was permitted to lapse in 1872. In 1888, Congress created a Department of Labor. The westward advance of white settlement of the North American continent is the background of the next developments in the history of U.S. administrative law. To consolidate control of the West, President Lincoln proposed the Homestead Act and the Railway Act of 1862. The Homestead Act to encourage settlement and the Railway Act to make westward expansion through settlement attractive. The Railway Act granted rights of way and privatized federal land in a checkerboard pattern to incentivize private investment in railways. Taken together, the two acts ceded lands totaling an area equaling that of California and Texas, which had been conquered from Mexico in 1842. The railroads constituted natural monopolies, and public outcry about the excessive rates and other abusive practices led Congress in 1887 to create the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is often referred to as the first modern administrative agency. It lasted much longer than the Freedmen's Bureau, but was dissolved in, 18, in, excuse me, in 1996, but most of its functions were preserved and transferred to the Department of Transportation. In the latter 19th and early 20th centuries, other monopolies arose, most notably the Standard Oil Company. A clever young man named John D. Rockefeller managed to gain ownership of the booming market for petroleum products and threatened to parlay that economic power into control of the steel, copper, and shipping industries as well. Enormic economic power conveyed enormous political influence in state houses and the U.S. Capitol. One tentacle of the octopus is shown here reaching for the White House itself. Think of John D. as the Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, and Mark Zuckerberg of his day, all rolled into one. Congress responded with the Federal Trade Commission Act of 1915 to dismantle monopolies and police unfair and deceptive trade practices. The Great Depression opened a new chapter in the history of U.S. administrative law. To restore confidence in banks, Congress created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, in 1933. To restore confidence in the stock market, Congress created the Security Exchange Commission in 1934. Recognizing the right of workers to organize and collectively bargain for better wages and working conditions, Congress passed the Wagner Act in 1935, creating the National Labor Relations Board. The Social Security Board, precursor to the Social Security Administration, was created to provide for old age and disability. The Tennessee Valley Authority was created to bring jobs and electricity to the rural Southeast. Most sweeping and most controversial of all was the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 intended to give the president broad powers to overcome the depression, its central provisions were declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court 
1935. The Second World War put a decisive end to the economic depression. The economy was put under central control and the entire nation enlisted in the war effort. Enlisted is too strong. An agency of the federal government was created to administer a military draft. Millions of formerly out-of-work Americans found employment in uniform. With what had been a permanent army of the unemployed now in uniform, a shortage of civilian laborers brought William, women into the industrial workforce in much larger numbers than ever before. Occupations that formerly had been assumed to be suitable only for males were open to women eager and able to show themselves as capable as anyone. At the end of the war, millions of men and women were demobilized and an economic boom ensued. The post-war economic boom was fueled by a host of federal programs intended to subsidize demand for goods and services. The Federal Housing Authority offered veterans low-cost loans to buy housing. In many cities, starting with Atlanta, the federal government built and maintained housing that the private market was not supplying. Veterans on the GI Bill got four years of subsidized higher education. Veterans also got access to business and agricultural loans on favorable terms. And the Veterans Administration provided near comprehensive health care and hospitalization. For our purposes, the most important post-World War II development was the enactment of the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946. The APA responded to the need to bring consistency to the procedures followed by the profusion of administrative agencies that had at an increasing rate accumulated over the prior decades. We will study certain of its key provisions in detail. The Second World War again raised expectations among American blacks. President Eisenhower desegregated the military services, and in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court held school, school desegregation to be contrary to the 14th Amendment, passed shortly after the Civil War, but shoved aside by the force of white resistance to the inclusion of African Americans in society. Jim Crow, the American apartheid, was an embarrassment to the U.S. in its Cold War against the Soviet Union, and Congress eventually took note. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was created in 1964 to combat job discrimination against minority workers. The Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity was created in 1968. A need for national response to unwanted environmental side effects of unregulated industrialization also began to be felt. The Federal Environmental Protection Agency was created to administer the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, signed into law in 1970 by President Nixon. Transportation as a source of air pollution and automobiles as a safety hazard and the need for public transportation led to the creation of the Department of Transportation in 1967. The events of September 11, 2001 constitute the most recent impetus to expansion of what is often now called the administrative state. Congress responded to this especially dramatic act of terrorism by the means it has almost as if by reflex chosen to use, the creation of a new agency. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS, created in the aftermath of 9-11 and swept up all or part of 22 existing agencies, such as the renamed Immigration and Customs Enforcement Bureau, a.k.a. ICE. Homeland Security quickly became the largest civilian agency with total employment of almost one quarter million people. The proliferation of federal agencies can seem comical. But not every governmental entity is a federal administrative agency. For example, Georgia State University is not. Many federal agencies are nested within other federal agencies, so a definitive count is difficult. An estimate of about, say, 250 agencies is close enough. In administrative law, we want to study the forest and examine particular trees with an eye toward what they have in common. Each federal administrative agency has its own charter, its own history, and its own culture. Other courses in the curriculum, such as tax and securities regulation, go into details that we will only skim over as instances of the larger picture. 